Hello class, this is Mr. Hart, and this podcast we want to get into the forces part of the chapter. And so the first question we want to ask ourselves is, what, a, what is a force? And so we use this word a lot. You may have been forced to do something or use force to get something done, or you may have forced an object out of your way or whatever it may have been, but we want to get a nice physics definition for the word force. Okay, And rather than have a written out description, the easiest way is just to visualize it. Okay, So I like to think of it like this. A force is anything that can speed something up, slow something down, make it change direction, or rotate, or change its shape. Change its shape. Excuse me. Okay. So for example, this you know soccer player he kicks this soccer ball. He's applying a force to make it speed up. Okay. This semi truck has to apply the brakes to slow down at an intersection. Okay. This. Uh, Football player is tackling this guy to make him change direction. This wrench is rotating this, you know, washer. Okay. And this slinky is changing shape because of gravity. Okay. So all these objects have a force applied to them. Okay. And so a force is going to be something that either speeds something up, slows it down, changes its direction, rotates it, or changes its shape. Okay. So just do a quick activity. Okay. Think about all the forces that you can have in the room you're sitting in right now, okay? You are probably sitting in a chair if you're watching this video, which means there's a force of gravity pushing on you, okay? The chair is pushing on you, okay, so you don't fall through it, okay? You may need to stand up. When you stand up, you change shape, okay? You may need to rotate your mouse or move your mouse, okay? You are applying a force to it when you do that, okay? You may need to change direction of where you're walking, in case you may apply a force to the floor or to yourself or other things like that, okay? You may need to open the fridge, which again changes its shape or rotates the door handle, okay? So all those things are forces, okay? They, you can, you know, I can't even list off all the forces you use in a day, right? But there's plenty of forces surrounding you, okay? And you, again, use them all the time. And so there anything that does these five things, okay? But we also want to understand what different types of force we have. Okay, so let's look at the different types of force. Um, one of the ones you're most commonly familiar with is gravitational force. Okay, this one you probably have known since you're a little kid. It's the force that causes things to fall, right? When you throw a ball up into the air, it's going to come back down. Okay, that's because of gravitational force. Force That's the pull of the earth pulling down on the ball. Okay, or what any object really is the gravitational force. Okay, so simple enough. Everyone knows that one. Let's talk about some other ones that you may not know, okay? There's the normal force, okay? Or another word for normal being perpendicular, the perpendicular force, okay? And this is a force an object exerts that is perpendicular to the surface. So, for example, you lay a book on a table. The reason the book does not fall through the table is because the table is pushing up on it, right? It's applying a normal force, okay? Or a force perpendicular to its surface, okay? Again, you're probably sitting on a chair. The reason you don't fall through your chair is that it's pushing back up on you so you don't accelerate through the chair, okay? It's also the reason why you don't crash through the floor, okay? It's also the reason your computer is not falling through the table or anything like that, okay? That's because of the normal force. Now, this force, in some cases, isn't very strong, which causes the object to break. For example, if you had an elephant sit on your table, it probably would collapse, right? Because it cannot exert as much normal force as the elephant is putting weight on it or gravitational force, okay? So if an object cannot put that much force on the other object, can't put that much normal force, then it will break, okay? This is how you see those karate guys, you know, chop those boards in half, okay? This is why you can rip a paper because you're exceeding the amount of normal force that object can put out, okay? But again, any object, if you push on it, it will push a force normal to you, right? Or a force perpendicular to its surface, okay? There are some other forces. Friction is a commonly known one, okay? It's the force caused by resistance to movement across the surface. This also causes heat on both surfaces, okay? So when you pull anything along the floor, okay, there's some, you know, very small, you know, roughness to the objects, but as those things move past each other, they're going to cause some friction, right? They're not going to be able to move perfectly, okay, because they're not perfectly smooth. So this is going to slow things down. It's going to generate heat and other things like that, okay? If you rub your hands together, 
Okay, the reason your hands warm up is because of friction, right? Your hands aren't perfectly smooth, so when they rub back and forth, rub back and forth, they're going to generate some heat, okay? Because they're hitting into each other, the molecules are hitting into each other, okay? But it's very good that we have friction because otherwise everyone would be like this poor polar bear who's slipping on the ice, right? Because ice is pretty low friction. So if everything had no friction, okay, then we wouldn't be able to stand up. We wouldn't be able to, you know, sit in our chair. We wouldn't be able to put things on our desk without them sliding off. Okay, so it's very fortunate that we do have friction. Okay, you may think, oh, it slows everything down. Well, that's true, but things wouldn't work if we didn't have it. Okay. Some other forces we want to know, okay, there's the applied force, okay, this is any type of force of striking or pushing on an object, okay, um, striking a hammer to a nail is applied force, you know, punching a wall is an applied force, shoving someone over is an applied force, okay, simple enough, any type of pushing or striking, okay. Then there's tension, okay, this is for things like ropes or cords or strings. Okay, when you pull on that object, there's tension in the rope itself that is wanting it to pull back. Okay, there is spring or elastic force in certain types of springs and bungee cords, rubber bands. Anything that can stretch really far is going to have an elastic force with it, right? This is why when you jump on a trampoline, it you know bounces you back up and down. Okay, that's from the you know spring and elastic force. Okay, and the last one you want to know is the electric or magnetic forces, okay, or electric and magnetic forces, right? This is why a magnet can hold on to metal, okay? This is why, you know, they, certain charged objects will repel each other, okay, because of electric and magnetic forces, okay? So those are the main types of forces that we want to know for this class. So any type of force that you um, see around you is going to usually fall into one of those categories that we looked at, okay? All right, and the last thing we want to cover is a very, very fundamental idea that we need to go through, okay, that was discovered by Sir Isaac Newton, okay, so Sir Isaac Newton, he was, you know, one of the very first, you know, recognized physicists in the world, okay, and he published a book called the Principia, okay, which had basically all the fundamental physics that we know today, okay, any entry-level college, you know, physics book that you read, most of that book probably came from the Principia as far as the formulas and the ideas, okay? They're all based on the foundations that Newton developed. But Newton had some very important ideas that are associated with force, okay? Which he called the laws of motion, okay? And there were three of them. We want to know them, okay? So Newton's first law says any object at rest will stay at rest unless a force acts upon it, okay? Most people would think that's true, okay? But here's the cool part. Any object moving will continue moving, unless the force acts upon it, okay? This part's a little bit more, you know, uh, interesting to think about, okay? So, but any object at rest will stay at rest unless the force acts upon it. That makes sense, right? If you're standing up, there's no reason for you to fall down, okay? Um, unless there's some other force that pushes on you, okay? A, you know, chair that's sitting there is going to sit there. It's not going to move for no reason, okay? But any object moving will continue moving unless the force acts upon it. Let's look at some examples of how this works, okay? So let's say, let's look at the game Corners, or I've heard some kids call it Jello, okay? But it's the game where you have a car and you're driving the car and the car takes a sharp turn, okay? And you have all the people inside the car, okay? And the people all, when they get to the corner, they will, you know, slide to the side and, you know, smush the guy that's on this side of the car, okay? Well, let's look why that why that is happening, okay? So these people are all moving forward, right? Because the car is moving forward. And so they want to keep moving in that direction. Well, when the car gets to this point, right, it has changed its direction, but the people in the car still want to go that same direction. So the person right here, he still wants to go this way. The person right there still wants to go that way. The person right there still wants to go that way. And the person right there still wants to go that way. So what happens? These people on this side are going to smush into the people on that side. Okay. Or in other words, they're all going to slam into the left side. Okay. So why is that? It's because of Newton's first law. You are continuing your motion. You want to keep going in the direction you were going. Okay. This whole idea is what we call inertia. Okay. Inertia. Newton's first law is known as inertia. You want to keep moving the direction you are moving. Okay. Now, some of you are saying, hey, this makes sense, but what about, you know, 
I have a calculator on my desk. When I push the calculator, it doesn't keep sliding across my desk. Okay, well, that goes back to the forces. You have that calculator on the desk, right? You push it this direction. But, but what force is resisting that movement? Well, it's friction, right? Friction is going to be pushing that way. And Newton's set law says if there's no forces, right? And so that's why your calculator keep, doesn't keep moving because there's a force that acts upon it. If your calculator was on a per perfectly frictionless surface, it would keep going. It keeps sliding. Okay, but we have friction, which is what slows it down. Okay. But again, we have to think of non-friction sur or surfaces, okay, N or frictionless examples, okay, in order to understand inertia. So corners is a good example. Let's look at another um, good example. Roller coasters. Okay. So let's say you have a roller coaster, and it has a loop to loop, and then it has a hill, and then it comes back down. Okay. Most people would say. If I, if I said which part of the roller coaster is the most dangerous, a lot of people say, oh, it's easily the loop, right? That's going to be the most dangerous. Okay, it turns out it's not. Okay, so let's say you're in this roller coaster cart and you're going down this hill. I'm going to draw your direction of motion in green. Okay, once you start going down this hill, this is the direction you want to go, right? If there was no other forces, this is the direction you want to keep going because the car is sliding in that direction, okay? But when you get to the loop, you still want to go this direction. So actually, you're getting pushed into your car. And then at this point, now you want to go this direction. But then again, you're going up, so now you're getting pushed into your car. And at this point, you're trying to go this direction. But then again, you're getting pushed into your car because the loop is changing again. So you see what's happening? Every time you're trying to change direction, you're actually getting pushed down in your seat. So you could actually survive a loop without your seatbelt. Okay, I do not recommend trying this, but you could theoretically survive without your seatbelt. The most dangerous part is actually this hill right here. Because what happens is once you start going up the hill, you want to go this direction. Okay, So if you weren't wearing your seatbelt, what would happen? You want to go this direction, the car wants to go back down. right? The car is going this way. So you would actually start flying off in this direction. Okay, And you would be you know, disconnected from your cart. Here's you flying away. There's your cart. <laughs> okay. So the most dangerous part of a roller coaster is not the loop. It's the hill because of inertia. You'll stay in your car on a loop because of inertia. You will not stay in your cart on a hill because you will fly off. Okay. Because your inertia will carry you that direction. All right. Is this making sense? All right. Hopefully that it does. Um, again, but just a very important law to understand. Okay, inertia, this idea you keep moving unless there's a force that acts upon you, right? That's why you wear your safety belt, because that's the force that keeps you inside the car. Okay, the next one, the next law he came up with, Newton's second law, was just an equation, basically. It says that the force equals the mass times the acceleration. Okay, and this is a very simple law. Okay, you just take the force that you are experiencing is equal to the mass of the object times how fast that object is going to accelerate. Okay, so mass times acceleration. So if I put a certain amount of force, I would expect a certain amount of acceleration. Okay, so this also explains why if you have, let's say, a big NFL lineman, okay, has a very large mass, okay, you need a very large force to move them, right? Because otherwise your acceleration is going to be very small. Okay. You don't see, you know, little kids hitting over an NFL lineman, right? Because they have very small amount of force, so there's really no acceleration. He doesn't move. You need a very large person with a very large amount of force to move that guy, okay? Because you need a larger force for larger masses, and thus smaller forces for smaller masses, right? To get some acceleration, okay? Let's see if we can just do a quick example problem. So we say a car has an acceleration of 20 meters per second per second. If the car has a mass of 400 kilograms, what is the force on the car? Okay, so very simple. We use F equals MA. This was our mass, or sorry, this was our acceleration up here. Here's our mass. Okay, so all we have to do is plug those in. Okay, so we say our acceleration was 20 and our mass was 400. That's going to give us a total force of 8. Okay, and in force, we use a special unit called newtons, okay, which we represent with the letter N. Okay, but that's our total force, 8,000 newtons. Okay, 
if I remember correctly, is around 400 pounds of force. Okay, don't call me on that. But um, again, we can just calculate this force just using the mass and acceleration. It's really simple. So if I had a larger car, I would need more force to get it accelerating. Okay. All right. So again, the second law is just this equation. And then the third law is this, that every action or force has an opposite and equal reaction. Okay. You probably have heard that before, but we can actually directly apply it to physics. Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. Or in other words, the force that object one puts on object two is the same force that object two puts on one. Okay. And so this one can be really hard to understand sometimes, again, because we live in a friction-based world, right? If we lived in a frictionless world, this would be kind of easy to see, but because we have a lot of friction and gravity and things like that, okay, this is hard to see. But the force on object one is the same as the force on object, that, or sorry, the force that one puts on two is the same as the force that two puts on one, okay? Let's look at an example of this, okay? Let's say you're standing on a skateboard, okay? So here's you. Again, I'm not the best drawer, so please forgive me. You're standing on your skateboard, okay? Let's say you want, you're just standing there, the skateboard's not moving, and let's say you just want to get off your skateboard and walk off in this direction, okay? Have you ever seen someone that's not trained to get off of the skateboard do this? Okay, what's going to happen? You try to move this direction, which means you have to put a force on the skateboard in this direction. So as they try to walk off the skateboard, the skateboard slides out from under them because they're putting a force on the skateboard itself, okay? And so the skateboard slides, they usually fall, they might trip or stumble a little bit, okay? It's kind of funny to watch, but this is why, Newton's third law. The force that they put, uh, the force that object one puts on two is the same force that two puts on one, okay? In order to walk off the skateboard, you gotta put a force on the skateboard, but the skateboard's also gonna accelerate you out. Okay, so why doesn't this happen if you're just on a flat surface? Okay, or you know, if you're just on the floor, is there not a force that you apply on the floor? Well, there is, right? You still have this force pushing left on the floor, but the floor is attached to the ground, which is attached to the earth, which is a very large object. It's not going to accelerate very much. So this is why we don't notice this. Okay, you still have to put a force on that object for that force for the object to put a force on you. Okay, but we don't recognize this because the Earth doesn't shift or move every time we walk on it. Okay, because of again things like friction and the large mass of the Earth and gravity, we don't notice this. But the third law still applies. Okay, this is also why, let's say you're leaning on a wall. Okay, here's the wall. Okay, you're putting a force on the on the wall. Okay. The wall is also putting a force on you in this direction. But the reason you don't move is because you have friction on the floor. Okay, the floor is keeping you in place so you don't move. Okay, if you were on an ice rink and tried to push on the wall, you'd start sliding away, right? On a frictionless surface, you'd slide, start sliding away. Or if you were in space and tried to push off a wall, then you would start sliding away. Okay, and again, the wall doesn't slide away because it's attached to the earth, which is very massive, so it doesn't move. Okay. So, again, hopefully this makes sense. Um, again, there's lots of materials and videos to help you understand Newton's three laws, but we want to make sure we have these down, okay? First law, the law of inertia, okay? Second law, F equals MA, and third law, opposite and equal reactions, okay? Make sure you understand those. Find videos on YouTube if you need to find more resources, okay? But make sure you have these down, okay? Let me know if you have any questions, and thank you for watching.